Worship is a very important thing. It allows us to connect with God and to sing His praises and His glory. One of the greatest things that we can do is just lift up the name of Christ in everything that we do and in all of our actions. And, you know, when you think about what we need to learn, we need to learn who He is. We need to learn what He's done for us, and we need to understand His mercy, and we need to understand His grace. But more than anything else, we need to learn and know that God wants to use you. God doesn't want you just to come into church. God wants to uniquely use you. In all of your gifts and even in your failures, God wants to take you where you are and move you to where he wants you to be. It's the thrill of life to be used by God. It's the thrill of life when somebody sees that you have something that they need and they talk to you. And you have the privilege of talking to them about your Lord and your Savior. It is the thrill to be able to be used of God to lead somebody to the Lord. It is a thrill that God has given to us just to be able to say, I want to be used of God, shaped for his service. God uniquely has gifted us to do what he wants us to do. But we are fearful of that giftedness. As we shared last week, we are shaped for his service. In the, in the spiritual given life, he says this, we are shaped to serve him. And the S stands for spiritual gifts. We all have a spiritual gift, something that God has given to us to, to serve others, to serve the body, to serve your community. And then you have to have a heart. What is it that you're drawn to? What is it that you're compelled to do? What is it that you have passion in? And then we have to look at our abilities. What is it that God has gifted me into doing? And if I have some abilities, I can serve God in whatever I do. Whether I work at Spirit or I work at, at uh, Target or whether I work at Walmart or I work for a school system, we have the ability to serve him in any place. And then our personalities. What is it, our, our personality? Are we, are we outgoing? Can we use our personality to, to bring glory and honor to him? As my buddy uh, Anthony said, bring attention to me so I can give glory to him. Remember that? Bring attention to me so I can give glory to him. He said it in a le very more charismatic way than I am, but that's what we're supposed to do, our personalities. And then there are our experiences. And that's where we're going to camp on today, our experiences. The good, the bad, and the ugly. We all have experiences that we have to put under the blood so we can carry on the cross. And if we do that, in Romans chapter 6, verse 13, it says, Give yourselves completely to God, every part of you, because you have been bought from death to life, and now that you want to be used by God for good and for his righteous purpose. The secret to be used by God is people secretly fear God can't use them. That I've gone too far, I've done too much, I've said too many things, I haven't, I haven't got the testimony or I do not have the pedigree, so I cannot be used by God. People feel disqualified from their past and for their poor choices. People feel unqualified due to their talents. But we have to say mercy is undeserved forgiveness. God is merciful. Undeserved forgiveness. Unearned kindness. Everything that you have, everything that God has blessed you with is because of his mercy. He loved us in spite of ourselves. He loved us in our mercy. Your past does not dictate what God wants to do with you. Your past is in the past. Once God has got a hold of your life, that past is over and forgiveness has occurred and now your future is in front of us. But so often we get caught in the past. So often we get caught on who we were. So often we get caught on what we went through. So often we get caught on my last marriage or what my kids did. And God says, you know what? Those things are real. Those things have impacted your life. Those things are experiences that you've gone through, but you can't allow the experiences that you've gone through to dictate not to do something for the glory of God. The experiences make us. And I say thank God for those experiences. Those experiences are the things in our life that has broken us to a point that we can see God. Arrogance, pride are the things that keep us from God. But when we are broken, those experiences within our life 
they have broken us and we can fall on our face before God and say, I don't know what to do. That's when God can take us in our broken, dirty vessels and say, now I can use you. You know, the Bible calls them clay pots, that we are all clay pots. And, and uh, you know what happens to clay pots when we drop them? They crack. So the Bible's actually calling you a bunch of crack pots is what the Bible's calling you. <laughs> and the greatest thing about that is we are cracked pots. Are you a crack pot? When we can admit that we're crack pots, God can take us and he can fix that pot and he can make that pot into something new and strong. Until we're cracked, until we're broken, our pride and our arrogance is on the way we look or what we do. But once our lives have been broken and we say, Lord, I need your help. My pot is broken. And Jesus says, it's about time you dropped your pot. Because I'm going to pick that thing up and I'm going to make it stronger. And I'm going to make it better. And I'm going to paint that pot so when people look at that, your life, they will see me. That broken pot is now usable because there's no pride. There's no arrogance. It's not about what you look like or what you do. It's are you a reflection of me? In Galatians chapter 1 verses 13 through 15 it says, You know what I was like. I was violently persecuted the Christians. I did my best to get rid of them. But then something happened for it pleased God in his kindness to choose me and call me even before I was born. What undeserved mercy. Paul saying, you knew what I was like. I was a persecutor of the Christians, but you still chose me to write over half of the New Testament. I was a persecutor. I was somebody that hated God, and I hated the faith. I hated the church. But God looked at my gifts, at what I had, and what I could do, and he changed me. Something happened. When I met Jesus, my life changed, and now God is doing something miraculous in my life. God knows in advance of your life. You were formed in your mother's womb. Your days were called by God way before you were born. God uses great people, but God only uses broken people. I just made a list of a bunch of people in the Bible and uh, maybe some of their failures and some of their insecurities, and God used them in a miraculous way. Abraham... He was 90 years old before God started using him. Jacob was a chronic liar. Leah was not very attractive. In today's terminology, she was, she was hit with an ugly stick. She was just <laughs> ugly. Joseph was abused. Gideon was poor. Samson was reckless and a codependent. Rahab was a prostitute. Jonah was fearful and reluctant. Naomi, Naomi was an elderly widow. Jeremy, Jeremiah was a chronic depression. David had an affair. John the Baptist was an eccentric. Peter had anger management. Martha was a warrior. The Samaritan woman had many failed marriages. Zacchaeus was a con artist. Timothy was timid. Moses, David, and Paul were murderers. But God used them. We could look at that list and we say, well, why would God use guys and women that were failures? And we have to remember, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, man looks at the outward appearance, but what does God look at? The heart. God looks deep within our soul. It's not about what we look like or what we can do. It's what our heart is all about. Every saint has a past, but every sinner has a future. Say amen to that. Every sinner has a future. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, it is God himself who made us that we are given a new life from Jesus Christ. A long ages ago, he planned that we should spend our days helping and serving others. So we can't be afraid of what we need to do. And the second thing is we need to be real. The church, we need to be real. We can't be this facade. We can't expect people to be like us before they become us. What we have to do is we have to get into our community and be genuinely real. Be real, authentic, genuine. In other words, be yourself. Be yourself. The church has failed in the past when we put our coat and tie on and came into church. What we need to do is we need to be who we are outside of church 
and then walk in genuinely into church. The people that need you are the people that doesn't know you. And when they don't know what you're going through, you're sitting in church here today on the opposite sides of people that are going through the same junk you are, that are dying on the inside, and you have the hope. Be real. Be genuine. When they can see that you are hurting, when they can see your cracked pot, they can say, you know what? I need to talk to that guy. That woman that's struggling, I would love to have a 10-minute conversation with her because I really don't know what to do. And that conversation could change their life. But we, when we put on our facade and we come into church to play the game, what we are doing is we're coming in and enjoying church. But God didn't call us to play church. God called us to impact people's lives, to get out of the church, to bring our glory to God way out of this church, not just within these four walls. So we have to be genuine. We have to be real. When you try to be someone you're not, Here's what happens. You're always under stress. Your fear of being exposed. And you start manipulating people so they'll never see who you truly are. You stay distant because you don't want to become close. You want people to think you're someone that God wants you to be, but you can't be without God. There's a movie called um, Groundhog. Um, not ground, wild hogs on the motorcycles. And uh, they were at this city and uh, they came up across the, a group of really bikers. And uh, they called them the posers. They posed to be bikers. And the, the leader of the group was up and he said, he came in, he saw him, he said, you guys, get rid of the watches. You're, you're looking like a poser. And so, so often we come into church and we pose as what God wants us to be. We act like God wants us to act while we're in church. We do what God wants us to do in church. And I'm saying, guys, we need to quit being posers. We need to be children of God. We need to be what Christ wants us to be every day of our life, not just when we're out, not just when we're in, but in every area of our life. In 2 Corinthians 4, 2, it says, we don't try to trick anyone and we don't twist the word of God. Instead, we teach them truth plainly, showing everyone who we really are. Then they can know in their hearts that kind of people we are in God's sight. We need to be who we are. God uses Bruce. He can use you. When you look at your pedigree and you look at your life, you can say, I shouldn't be doing what God has called me to do. But that's not the case. I had the privilege of speaking at camp just a few weeks ago. And speaking at camp, it was kind of unique because the kids, they didn't know my story. They don't know where I came from, and they didn't know my life. And um, I speak here, and you say, Bruce, I've heard your story over and over and over and over and over again. But, you know, the new people that walk in these doors, they know me as Pastor Bruce, but they don't know what put me to Pastor Bruce. And every experience that we have had in our life takes us to the point of where we are today. And there's always those focal points, those points within our life that radically changed the direction of your life and what you did to get to where you are. You could either go a different direction because of a situation, or you can say, you know what, I'm doing the right thing. I believe that we cannot be the ministers of the gospel until we're open and honest with you. And then remember, it's not about me. The thing that we have to realize before we can minister to people, it's not about me. Bitter from a problem or prideful from a blessing. Whatever we do, we have to give glory and honor from him. In 2 Corinthians 4, 5, our message is not about ourselves. It is about Jesus Christ the Lord. We were merely your servants for Jesus Christ. We are merely your servants for Jesus Christ. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about him. As we said early in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, we are like clay jars in which the treasure is stored. The real power comes from God and not from us. The real power in our life is not from us. The real power is God's mercy from him. When we say, I want to be used by God, 
I want God to use me. It's his mercy that wraps around your life, your gifts, your lifts. And what he does is he uses us to do great things. Service with gratitude changes people's lives. But what we have to do is it's not about me. It's not about you. When, when we had the convoy of hope and we had all these people out there ministering, guess what? It's not about you. It's about what you did. It's about your willingness to serve. It's about you working in the nursery or you working in the children's ministry or you singing praise worship on the platform. If it's look at me, that's all you're going to get. But if it's a reflection to God, God's mercy can overshadow that and God can bless you because of it. But we need to understand, we need to use our pain to help others. We need to use our pain to help others. People hurt. People are struggling. I, I, I can go through our lives and go through our church and, and I can see the pain that people have gone through, the issues that people have gone through, and they may not say anything out loud. But the struggle you wake up with every morning is so overwhelming that you deal with it and, and you're thinking, I don't know if I can deal with this any longer. And the pain, the struggles are captivating. And people don't understand. So you feel like you have to go through life alone. Nobody cares. If I was a good Christian, I, it wouldn't happen to me. But guess what? Bad things happen to very good people. And struggles go on. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we used this verse last week. It says, Paul, I have been in prison, whipped 39 times. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I've been in perilous waters, robbers, my countrymen by the Gentiles, in the wilderness and the sea, among the false brethren, in weariness and toil and sleeplessness, often in hunger and thirst, in fastings often and cold and nakedness, besides the other things which comes to me daily by keeping concerns of the church. He had all kinds of stuff going on. And he said, but my calling is not what I'm going through. My calling is to serve and to help others. We often suffer, but we are never crushed. Even when we don't know what to do, we will never give up. In times of trouble, God is with us. And when he, we knock down, we get up again. In verses 8 and 9. All these sufferings are for a short time. Because we have one other hope. And that other hope is we have to keep our eyes focused on eternity. We are here for a purpose. We are here to honor God. There are three kinds of sufferings in our benefit. Here they are. We bring sufferings to ourselves because of what we do. Um, there's innocent suffering because of what somebody else has done. Somebody else hurt us. As a child, somebody did something to us or, or somebody said something to us as a child. And out of your innocence, you got hurt. And that suffering is real. And I, I, I am sorry. I mean, it happens a lot. And we do a lot of counseling with a lot of people that are suffering because of somebody else's actions. And it's real. And it hurts. It scars them for a long time. And it changes their life. It changes the way they look. And we have to understand, sometimes our suffering is because of what we've done. And sometimes our suffering is because of what somebody else has done. But there's a redemptive suffering. When you choose to suffer to help others. In other words, to share your pain may cause you pain. To share your pain may open up your pain. To be able to be a blessing to somebody else, you may have to go into your scar and to deal with your pain again that you haven't dealt with in a long time. Jesus was our redemptive sufferer. He died on a cross, despising the shame. Take upon the, the sins of the world for your sins and mine. That was redemptive. We can't die on the cross for everybody's sins. But a redemptive suffering is this. When you know somebody needs you. When you know that your story needs to be told. When you know that your junk in your life that you're trying to keep a secret needs to be communicated. That's redemptive. That's let me help somebody that needs help. And when we can do that, God can do great things through us. Well, there's also three motivations. The three types of motivation is internal. Internal is what makes me happy. External motivation is other people, what they think. I want to please everybody. I want to do what everybody wants me to do. 
But then the greatest type of motivation is eternal motivation. What does God want? It's not about what I want, and it's not necessarily what you think of me. Is I want to honor God and what God has done within my life. In Ecclesiastes 4.12, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. The three, and three people are even better. A triple braided cord is not easily broken. When we look at what God can do with us, God can change us. He can work within our life. Do you want a life well lived? Do you want a life that when they close the door on your life, they can say, he didn't have a lot of money. He wasn't the most popular person in the world. But what he did, he shared his life. He gave his life to serve others. The greatest, most exciting feeling that you could have is when God says, I want you to help me, to help them. And when God says, I want you, it is a roller coaster ride. It may not happen instantaneously, but there are people in the church, there are people in your life, there are people that are struggling that need you. They don't know they need you. They don't even know they want you. But God has made a divine appointment with you into someone's life. And he's taken your shape your experiences and your pains and your personalities and your heart and your spiritual gifts. And he's taking who he has made you and he's bringing somebody around you. And you're saying, Lord, what can I do? And he has made that divine appointment. And the door is going to knock. And it may be at work and it may be at church or maybe at your house. But we have to be willing and ready to allow that door of opportunity to be opened. And the scars that you have, the pains that you have, the story that you want to hide needs to be told. Not to bring glory to you, but to help someone else and to bring glory to God. We have to be real. And the only way that we can do what God wants us to do is not be afraid to do what God has called us to do. Called us to be ministers. Not to be preachers. Not to be pastors. But to be ministers. Ministering means helping. Just get into somebody's life. When somebody's struggling, love them. When they're the outcast, bring them in. When they feel like nobody cares or nobody will love them or somebody did something wrong to them and they are in their shell of depression, come alongside them. Love them. Help them. That is what the church is called to do. When we do what God has called us to do, not come to church, but go out of church and to do something great, minister to someone that is in need, Give your life to something greater than yourselves. And my favorite, one of my favorite movies of all time was The Man in the Iron Mask. Anybody ever watched The Man in the Iron Mask with the three musketeers? And they're in the dungeon, and these three musketeers were guarding the king. And uh, the, finally the king did something that was wonderful. And he said something, the three musketeers said to him, he said, I lived my entire life. I've waited my entire life for this moment. I want to serve and be somebody greater than myself. I want to serve you. And the highest calling upon my life is to serve somebody or do something greater than myself. And when we serve Jesus, when we honor what God wants us to do, we are serving and doing something greater than ourselves. Ourselves, we can do very small. But when we serve God, we can do something very, very, very big. We can change people's life. So we're going back to school. We're going back to school and we're going to learn how to do that. Next week, we're going to learn how to hear God's voice in our hearts. 
Have you ever wondered, is that God speaking to me or is that Satan speaking to me? Is that, is, that what, is that what God wants me to do or is that what Satan wants me to do? How can we determine when God is speaking to me? How do we know that? How do we hear God's voice? It's kind of like the good, sh- good angel and the bad angel talking in your ears. There's clearly a well-defined way that you can hear whether it's God speaking to you or Satan speaking to you. Whether it's your desire or it's God's desire. And we're going to go to school next week and we're going to learn how to hear God's voice. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for your love to us. We thank you for teaching us what we need to learn. And Lord, what we need to learn is to be used by you. Anyone can be used by God by using our experiences and our past, our fears, our insecurities, and use it and allow you to break us and to make us, to change us, to be who you want us to be. Lord, we thank you for that. We honor you. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.